Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Seth Manukin. I am the director of the Communications Forum. Uh, and I am only here to introduce the speakers, and then you will no longer need to look at me. Uh, um, the uh, moderator of the conversation uh, is David Thorburn, and before I introduce him, um, this is also in some ways a celebration of David's long tenure as director of the forum. Uh, everything that the forum is, is because of his, uh, through sheer force of his will and intellect, um, he's been a real driving force uh, and has created something really special here. So um, I know I owe him a big debt, and I think we all owe him a big debt, so thank you very much for that, David. <laughs> and there will be a reception um, following this, uh, this being MIT and nothing being simple. Um, it is not near where we are, but in... Uh, building 14 and 14E303, 304, okay, 14E304, um, you do not need to go outside to get there, and if you don't know where that is, you can sort of follow the herd afterwards, um, but we will have uh, refreshments for everyone. Um, so, uh, in addition to being the Director Emeritus of the Communications mm -hmm. Forum, um, David is an uh, MIT literature professor. Uh, and this is, I believe, his 40th year at MIT, is that right? You don't look a day over 50. Um, <laughs> he started young. Uh, he has taught um, courses ranging from media and transition to comedy, uh, and his MIT lecture course, The Film Experience, has been taught to undergraduates for more than 35 years and is about to be published on open courseware. Um, he's a past winner of MIT's McVicker Award for exemplary contributions to undergraduate teaching. Uh, next to him is Robert Pinsky, a three-time U.S. Poet Laureate, the author of 19 books, which makes me tired just thinking about, um, and the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor of English and Creative Writing at Boston University. Uh, he has won the William Carlos Williams Prize from the Poetry Society of America, the Harold Washington Award from the City of Chicago, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, the Pan American Center. Um, and you are currently uh, working on furthering digital education, is that right, by teaching the art of poetry through edX. Um, uh, Alan Guth, who's immediately next to Robert, uh, is MIT's Victor Weisskopf Professor of Physics, um, pioneer of the inflationary model of the universe, and another recipient of the McVicker Award for exemplary contributions to undergraduate teaching. Uh, he was an inaugural awardee of the Fundamental Physics Prize and a co-recipient of the 2014 Kavli Prize, awarded by the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. Um, he's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, and his The Early Universe course is currently available through OpenCourseWare. Um, and on the end of the table, uh, Hazel Siv is a biology professor here at MIT, um, principal investigator uh, with the Civ Lab, and a member of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. Um, she has been at MIT since 1991 and was the first associate dean of the MIT School of Science. Uh, she currently has three biology courses available through OpenCourseWare um, and was named a recipient of the a winner of the 2015 McVicker Award um, for exemplary contributions to teaching. She's also a great storyteller, uh, and I know this because she and I were did a story collider together, um, and in April is gonna be telling another story on stage, is that right? At the uh, Hayden Planetarium at the Museum of Science, um, so look out for that. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to them, and thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank my distinguished colleagues and panelists for uh, joining me on this, uh, what I think of as sort of my farewell forum. I'd also like to remind the audience that one of the signature features of the forum in, during my time as director has been interaction with the audience. And our usual format, which I hope we will follow today, is about an hour of discussion among the panelists and then an hour with the audience, and I hope those, I, I see a number of fellow, of, of our fellow McVicker winners in the audience. I hope that the second part of our conversation in which the audience is asked to participate will be even livelier and more remarkable than the first part. 
I asked each of our panelists to think about uh, uh, this question before we convene today, and I want to ask each of them now to uh, speak very quickly to this question. I asked each of them to think about uh, uh, naming for us and describing for us a memorable teacher from their past. And perhaps I should say parenthetically that as I begin, teaching has been at the center of my life, I realize, all my, all my, all my life. It's always been a, uh, an activity I took as sort of central to my experience. And I think I was a, always a strong and serious teacher, but I came to realize as we approached this forum that uh, uh, I have uh, not too many abstract principles to, to suggest about what makes a good teacher, and I'm hoping that our conversation will confront that problem about how subjective many of us are about what our, what our work involves. In any case, I thought, I thought that one way of getting at some of the things that are hidden about why we value teaching and what it is in teachers we care about, if I would ask these distinguished teachers and, and uh, uh, practitioners, scholars and writers, uh, to describe a memorable teacher from their past, a teacher who mattered to them very much. And let's start with Robert. Thanks, David. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm very glad to have an occasion to pay tribute to Mr. Angus McWithy, uh, who was my teacher in the eighth grade in Long Branch, New Jersey, in a class, it was all boys, because it was the bad class. And it was a subject that was designed for people who were not destined to go to college. And the subject was mechanical drawing. In the first or second meeting of the mechanical drawing class, Mr. McWithy told us that I believe this was, I think this is the first true intellectual discussion I can ever remember having. It certainly is the first intellectual discussion I can ever remember having in a classroom. <clears throat> McWithy told us that you begin your drawing of an object, but first elevation you do is the front of the object. And then he said to us, what, how do you determine the front of an object? Uh, if it moves, whatever goes first. I see, so what is the front of the factory? Uh, well, it's, um, it's where things come in and out. So is the front of a toilet bowl the bottom or the top? <laughs> Etc. And he got a bunch of, I would describe us as would-be thugs. He got us very interested and in arguing with one another and supplying introductions like those, uh, objections like those I've mentioned to different theories of what is the front of an object. And um, it isn't where things come in and out. It's if a person, uh, where a person would come in and out. So the front of your car is the side etc. And he may have given us the first of those um, little Socratic demurs or objections. And uh, we were having pleasure in stretching our brains. So he took this classroom of uh, official dopes and doing very little, and he was a very stern man, very strict man doing very little, but because he knew a good question when he asked one, um, he got us going. The front of an object in the McWithy dictum is the elevation that gives the most information about it. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> OK. Uh, when David first asked me this question, I was uh, in a bit of a conundrum, because I really have had a number of, of great teachers uh, from high school to college to graduate school. Um, so I decided to pick one. Um, the, the person I'd like to talk about is uh, a former MIT professor, no longer alive, uh, named Felix Valores. Some of you may have known him. Uh, he was a nuclear theory person in the Center for Theoretical Physics. And when I was an undergrad here at MIT, uh, and uh, he was our teacher for three terms of theoretical physics, uh, the last three terms of the physics major, uh, two terms senior year, one term junior year. Uh, and he carried us through one term of classical mechanics, if I remember right, one term of electromagnetic theory, and then 
one term of quantum theory. Uh, what characterized his teaching uh, was that he was not at all flamboyant. And I have a feeling if you asked any of us sometime in the middle of that three-term stretch, did we really think he was a great teacher, he probably would have said he was an OK teacher, but not necessarily a great teacher. Uh, but when I began later to study for my general exams when I was a graduate student and went back over all those notes, uh, I was incredibly impressed uh, with how tremendously well he had organized the material so that everything just fit together beautifully. Uh, everything was just crystal clear. And I really, really appreciated that. And I, I think all of us did. Um, he really did a fabulous job, not in making the class necessarily feel exciting minute to minute, uh, but in really putting across the material in a way that made it seem so easy we didn't even realize that we were learning pretty sophisticated stuff. OK, I, I have to stand up to tell you my thing. I, it's a pleasure to be here. I have to tell you, I didn't know this existed before I was invited to be here. And I'm sorry, because I think it's great. I, no, no, no. I, no, I think it is a wonderful commentary on the richness of the offerings at MIT right. and how hidden they are, often from you know, people who might be really um, engaged in them. So I'm delighted that I know this. And you know, <laughs> henceforth, we'll make an effort to come. You know, my teacher that I want to pay tribute to um, is Barry Fabian, who was my professor of biology at Witts University in Johannesburg, where I got my um, first two degrees. That is in South Africa. And South Africa, when I was growing up, was a very in-the-box kind of place educationally. You, it still is to some extent. But at the time, you know, there was rote memorization. Okay, And I was good at it, but that was how we learned. There was not much room for um, thinking creatively. But the day I walked into Barry's class, he stood at the board. He was a young assistant professor. He was going to tell us about developmental biology, which ended up being my subject. And he picked up his chalk. And he said, OK, I'm going to tell you about what I'm going to tell you about. Um, let's just you know, lay out the, the groundwork. And he took his chalk, and he drew a line across the board. And then I have the disposition wrong. He drew a line across the board. And then there was a wall. you know, And he went on the wall with his chalk. And he went all around the wall. And he went <laughs> <laughs> across the closed door. And he went up the passageway. And there was a door at the back. And he went out the door. And he walked down. And he came back. And he went back along the wall. Whoops, where was our board? And he went back along the board. And there we were. Okay. <laughs> well, we were incredulous. We were just stunned that a professor would you know, deface the walls and go outside the bounds of the blackboard. But it was an unbelievably important experience because it actually was opening up the box. You know, it was opening up the box of rote memorization that we were all in and saying that there were ways that you could go somewhere else that were interesting and they were allowed. He gave us license to go somewhere else. And you know, that was, I would say, a transformative lecture. And actually, he was a very awesome individual who still is, and now he is a dear friend of mine. But that moment of being given license to think about whatever it was, the line was emblematic of whatever it was, to think about the line in a way that could go beyond the bounds of where you thought it was, where you thought it was contained. I would say that you know, that was a transformation that I took with me forever and ever. That's a, that's a wonderful story. I, I, I have an anecdote, although it's a, it's a reverse, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an anti-anecdote. It's a, it's, a, it's a bad teacher anecdote. When I was a sophomore in college, I stumbled onto a course called European Backgrounds of English Literature, of, uh, European Backgrounds of English Literature, and the first writer on the syllabus was Dostoevsky. I'd never heard of him. I read about 50 pages of Crime and Punishment and fell into a trance. I'm sure there are other readers of Dostoevsky have had this experience. You have to maybe be at the right age and have a kind of literary energy in you. But I was overwhelmed by this book. I had never encountered a book that had the kind of energies that seemed to me to fall off every page. And I was 
uh, I became so obsessed by, by Dostoevsky that not only did I read Crime and Punishment, I was taking my other courses too, but I, not only did I read Crime and Punishment and the other books on the syllabus, but I read other Dostoevsky, including the brothers Karamazov, within a, an incredibly short space of time. Too short even to remember what was going on in the book, but it was one of those orgies of reading that one falls into. And I wrote my term paper, the, only the second term paper I'd ever been required to write in college on, dust, on crime and punishment. And I poured my soul into that paper. It was, a, uh, it was a, uh, a religious experience to write about this writer who had mattered so, who came to matter so much to me. When I got the paper back from the professor, it, 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 it contained no marginal uh, words, although there were occasional uh, vertical marks made in pencil in the margins and question marks, two or three in the whole paper. And at the end of the paper, there was this comment, a, a grade, a B plus, and a, and a comment, not bad. <laughs> that was when I resolved to be a professor who would grade his students' papers in a respectful way. <laughs> and I've tried to stick to that <laughs> for 50 years. Uh, I, I mention that example because I think, in fact, it's often the case that we, one can be as discouraged and as damaged by bad teaching as one can be exalted by good teaching. Um, one of the things that's implicit in, what, in, in, the anecdotes, in the anecdotes we heard that I'd like us to sort of expand on a little bit more fully is, is this. Uh, Alan suggests that the teacher, the teacher he identifies as having been valuable and important was, an, was a person who had command of his material and whose mastery of the material was communicated to the students. He even implied that this was not a professor who was very charismatic and exciting and passionate in the way that we normally think interesting teachers are. So one model that's suggested here is just the model of intellectual mastery, at least at the level of, 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 of university education, uh, where the question of the teacher's ability to engage our, us emotionally or to fascinate us because the teacher has some kind of uh, charismatic energy seems not, not relevant. On the other hand, Hazel's <laughs> uh, anecdote suggests a kind of charismatic teacher who wants to shock us into an awareness that we might not otherwise have and implies that the classroom can be a place of transformative surprise. Whereas Allen's model suggests it's a place where you, of, of accretive learning. Now, I don't mean we have to make a choice here, but I'm curious about how each of you feel about these distinctions as, uh, and if you can say some more about them. Uh, well, I guess maybe I should speak first. I, I, I certainly also admire charismatic teachers. I, I shouldn't uh, make it sound like I think the only thing a professor needs to do is to present the facts. Uh, but in a subject like theoretical physics, the presentation of the facts is extremely important. And getting them clear and getting them all in a consistent notation with the signs right and everything uh, is incredibly valuable. Uh, and uh, I should maybe add that Professor Villars was not really a dull lecturer, but uh, but I think he was not particularly charismatic. Uh, what was his particular strength was the incredible degree to which he was able to organize the material. Um, I certainly have had other teachers who have been very charismatic, and I admire those as well, and try to the extent that I can to be a little bit charismatic myself. Uh, I think it does help in teaching. Uh, but I, at least in some subjects, I think it's also incredibly important uh, to really organize the material in an intelligent way. You know, one, 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 one aspect of what you're saying is the question of the, of the difference between a lecture class and a, and a discussion class. Uh, the, Robert's example is the example of the teacher who interacts with individual students in ways that awakens them in some sense. Does, it mean, does this mean that lecture courses, that the hostility that so many people feel toward lecture courses is really justified? And, <laughs> uh, or that lecture courses are only appropriate for really advanced level students? I, uh, what, do you guys have hmm. feelings about that? It occurs to me that they're two, uh, they're very similar. They both refer to a larger context, in your case, temporal. Hmm. That your judgment of the teaching, you said that while it was happening, it was OK. Then retrospectively, over the years, the combination of clarity and complexity is what made it impressive. And similarly, Hazel said, in the context of an extremely rigid uh, memorization-based institutional structure in that context, uh, again, over time. So that in both cases, there's an historical aspect to it. 
And uh, good teaching is, in this way, very different from good performance. Mm. In fact, the knockout class, where everybody says, what a great class, may not be effective teaching at all, because there's a larger temporal context or a larger institutional context. Uh, and just simply making a hit is not the point of teaching, mm -hmm. though it is done. Well, I have to confess that, I mean, one of my anxieties all my career as a teacher has been that I know I can fool my students. I say, I know I can make them feel that they've had an exciting experience, even if they haven't. And I think that, I think that some gifted teachers, mm. maybe many, have this problem. I, say, I mean, it, it's easy to seem to mesmerize them if you, if you have a kind of theatrical uh, character. And I think many good teachers do have a kind of actorly dimension to their work. But that's not the same as being a good teacher. And, and uh, I wonder whether you've had that same experience. Well, you know, I, I think it's a very, this is a very complex question, isn't it? You know, I think there's some balance between um, the scholarship that one has to communicate in the lecture and the storytelling aspect, which is the engaging part of the lecture. And I think the balance shifts from the introductory courses up to the graduate courses. You know, I teach introductory biology, and I really view my role there as the erudite storyteller who can capture you know, my large class, who can, you know, there's lots of aspects to this, but who can capture the large class and tell something which is compelling and you know, if oversimplified, largely accurate. Yes. And that's kind of the hook because for a lot of these students, they are not gonna get more biology as they go through the institute. So they, they need to listen and they need to be there. And you know, I'm the best person within the course with my co-professor who can actually tell them the story of biology. And I think um, I'm very aware of that at the introductory level that there's, you know, there's the information that has to be correct, but there's the engagement that is really important. Now when I teach, you know, my graduate students the other semester, I think the balance really shifts to scholarship. And I think there, what is telling a story, but actually it's the scholarship, it's the thread of being able to synthesize the material and give it to students so that they really notch up in their way of thinking about a topic and in their understanding of the topic. And of course, you know, there's a nice sort of collegial interaction, the classes are smaller, but the dynamic is so different than the introductory courses. So I think you're, the, the answer to your question is a sort of, it depends, you know? So, but you're, you would be a defender of lecture courses. I love lecture yes. courses. I think we don't, <laughs> I, love le I love lecturing. <laughs> I love, you know, the opportunity to have 300 parallel conversations with each of my students. I kind of view lecture as an opportunity to have this, you know, multi-conversation. I love seeing people who are listening. I love it when the class goes really quiet and you know that everyone really is listening. And, you know, yeah, I think it's, a, we, it's an opportunity to build a community that goes beyond the lecture material that actually you know, goes into the whole experience of being part of the MIT community and of the particular class. So I think lecture serves much more at the introductory levels especially than just communicating the information. Um, I think as, you, as I said, I think as time goes on and students become more mature, the scholarship really kind of trumps the community aspect, but I think lecture always has the opportunity for building community, and I think building community amongst groups is always a terrific thing. One of the implications of our conversation so far, at least it seems to me an implication, is that there may be a difference, or perhaps there's a difference, between the demands of a humanities classroom or a social science classroom and a science and a science classroom. And I'm wondering, except Robert and I can sort of defend the humanities, and you guys can defend the sciences. Do you think there's a difference? Do you, in your practice, do you believe there's a difference? I think I have a hard time knowing how to answer that question because I've never taught a humanities class. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't even been to a humanities class in many, many, many years. Um, my, my guess is that there are differences, but, uh, but I, maybe I would say that I expect that there's more commonalities than differences. Um, certainly in both cases, one does need to engage the class. And I, was, I really like what uh, 
what Hazel just said about lectures. I'm also a big enthusiast of, of lectures. Uh, and to me, a lecture really is a, uh, an interaction between a speaker and an audience. I, I don't think a lecture is anything like a, a somebody getting up in front of the audience like a movie and just saying things. Right. Uh, you're always looking at the people um, reacting to their facial expressions, even if they're not asking questions. And I think there's a very strong element of responsiveness on the part of the lecturer uh, to the audience uh, that's very real and creates something that uh, really can't happen any other way. Look, and I would guess that's true whether one's but, talking uh, but about But one, one kind of argument that they, I mean, I'm, I'm on your side, of course. I mean, I, I love lecturing. I would die if I couldn't <laughs> lecture. But I, I the, the, the one complaint that they make that is very common about lectures is that there's something kind of, uh, the, the absence of interaction is what, is what people complain about. Why should students sit passively and listen to an expert, especially now in, the, in, the, in, in an age when they can um, do, do, do some kind of digital search and, fi and find something online, or uh, in which they can simply read the material? What justifies? Uh, gathering 100 or 200 students in one space and have an expert talk to them instead of just hand them a text. Hazel gave a very good uh, anticipatory response to that by saying she was 300 separate conversations, parallel conversations with her students, and that when the room falls silent, you know they're paying attention. Mm. And uh, adequate lecturing, good lecturing, is interactive. You're, you're sensing when the students, you're following facial expressions, uh, you hear a lot of coughing or less coughing, right. <laughs> um, so forth. I can remember lecturing uh, Shakespeare for non-majors at Berkeley. And uh, I've never taken a Shakespeare course, it's just my bright ideas about <laughs> Shakespeare. And um, in Berkeley, you know, dogs would wander in and out of the classroom. <laughs> there were people from Telegraph Avenue who would come in to relax indoors for a while. Sure. And it had, it was like your word communal, extending into the, yeah. and there are times when you could feel, at every moment, you can feel a kind of graph of right. uh, tension. And in those, uh, in those, I always would interrupt myself, but I always stop after 10 or 15 or 20 minutes and invite remarks. Well, maybe the question is too difficult or too vague, but I hope that you and the audience will consider it too, and maybe we can come back to it when we c come to the can I say audience participation. About and humanities? Yes, yeah, but that's the topic I want us to sort of come back to as well, but yes, of course. Uh, I may be sentimental about science. Um, I, it, when you said that, it occurred to me that I chose a classroom that was teaching a technical subject, if not precisely scientific, a little bit more of an engineering subject. And I realized the last time I talked to uh, the extremely ambitious, very, M BU has a very small MFA program. And uh, thanks to a donor, every year, eight of the BU poets get global fellowships. They go away to, for up to two months to any non-English speaking country. And the theory is it's very good for a writer, particularly an American writer, to experience a different culture. These used to be competitive. Fortunately or unfortunately, we now have enough money where everybody gets one who wants one. <laughs> and I had looked at the proposals, and I said to this small group of students, I'm not scolding you, though it may seem I'm scolding you. I don't think we have been exacting enough in asking you to describe these proposals. You're not tourists. You're not there to say I had a great time in Romania or somewhere. And I. As you said that, I remember that I said to them, it's as if you're a scientist. You're doing marine biology somewhere. What are the books? What's the bibliography? What are the issues? Mm -hmm. What, you know, be a scientist mm -hmm. about this, I said to this group of poets. So, um, and I, I, as I said, prefacing that remark, in a way, I'm sentimental about science. When there are conversations about uh, if you show a certain film or read a certain book, do you have to give people this, uh, I think the controversy is uh, fading a bit, about uh, what do they call them, uh, trigger words, and must you- Trigger uh, warnings. Trigger mm. warnings. Mm. And I, I have said to classes, this is like being a scientist. If this exists and you want to study it, you have to deal with it. It's part of what the material is. This is data. And you, you can't ignore it. So it, it, 
I hope these aren't just figures of speech. I think it's actual respect for knowledge, which applies to my example of good teaching. He wanted us to know something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can, can I make a comment about lecture? You know, I'm so interested to hear what you all think. There's so many like vicar fellows sitting out there. Like, I don't know. I, you know, we should all be around a table rather than you know us and yes, us and I them. Agree about you know, that. Um, but I think you know. I tell my advisees, you know, there's two things that will get them through a course. They go to lecture and they do the problem sets and they'll pass, you know, and I think that that is largely true. And what is it about going to lecture, you know? Um, and there I think we're very into science of learning and, you know, education science and so on. But, you know, there is a cognitive reason for that. I think if material goes in through the eyes and it goes in through the ears and it goes in by handwriting, then there's some neural circuits that get engaged and there's something, the student sitting there at least has heard of it, you know, it's on a piece of paper, at least has heard of it and then that can be shored up with other uh, mechanisms. I think, you know, you just don't engage like that when you watch a video, when you read a book, it's this kind of, you know, three-way entry that I, I think is not substitutable and I think unless people are actually sitting together in a room, they're not fully engaged because, you know, if you're watching it on the web, even if you're taking notes at the same time, you know, you quickly just check the news or the weather and then come back to the lecture. So I think there's something actually that's very deep, you know, that's a cognitive neuroscience reason that there are lectures and that lectures are really valuable. And of course, there are different levels of interesting and not interesting lectures, but I think that reason is a really solid reason, and unless humans, you know, evolve, I, I don't see that reason going away and the value of lectures going you away. You think that as at a movie or a play, the experience of the audience, being part of an audience, that the feeling or sensing the other people around you is part of the benefit of it? Oh, I think that's a really interesting question. I think so. I think it's, you know, it's the community thing, you know, and I think a lecture is such a living, experience, you know, all of a sudden on, you know, whatever, whenever Valentine's Day was or the day before, I was in the middle of my lecture and of course the logs burst in to serenade someone and I immediately <laughs> threw them out because I just needed all the time, you know. But that was a kind of, that was a participatory thing, you know, everyone was in it and they applauded my, you know, throwing out the logs <laughs> after I'd done it, you know. And we had a really good rapport for the rest of the lecture, you know. So I think there's sort of the incident experience, you know, or the professor writes something incorrect on the board, that's always a bonding experience for the class <laughs> when the professor has to correct herself. So I think, yeah, there's this kind of, you know, this real time, real people, who are you sitting next to, you know, and so on, that um, it, it makes it a real an experience, you know, when you know you're alive there. It's, it's actually a real living experience. Yeah. Okay. I, guess I would add that, that I really think the analogy between theater and, and lecture is, is, is real. Uh, you know, one might have thought that live theater would disappear when movies reached a certain quality and you could have color and now even three-dimensional movies. Uh, but despite many, many years of excellent movies, live theater is, is a well and going strong. And probably there are more live theater productions per year now than, than ever in the past. Um, and it doesn't seem to be dying anytime soon. I think there really is something about the live experience that excites people. And I think it's almost as true for le academic lectures as it is for theater performances. Yeah, there's no question, I think, that the sort of existential energy that exists in a live classroom is a critical element in, in, in teaching. But the question, of course, is whether or not the sort of information that's presented in a lecture really couldn't be presented just as concisely in, in, in prose. Why is it that, is it, is it a, a failure on the student's part that they, can't, they just don't have the energy, but they're, they're, it's, it makes it easier for them to absorb the information? It's a complicated issue. But I had one other observation about lecturing. I'm not sure there's, I don't know enough about science teaching to to be sure, but I have the sense that what I do when I lecture in a literature course or in, in the film course uh, involves something more than presenting information. I, I, I mean, I try to be as rigorous and exact and as fact-filled as I can be in the lecture, and I spend a lot of time organizing how I want to present it and the information that I want to give them. But I, but I, what I, but I never write my lectures out, and and. Uh, this is, I'm copying the best lecture I ever studied with when I was an undergraduate who I found 
really uh, inspired me. What I try to do when I lecture, and I think a lot of the people that have meant the most to me as teachers have done this, I think what I'm also doing for the students is modeling thinking. That is to say, because I don't write it out, even though I know the stuff backwards and forward, and if I didn't know the material very well, I don't think I would be effective. But because I know the material so well, it seems to the students as if I'm actually sort of struggling to figure out what I want to say. All I'm actually doing is trying to sort of uh, winnow all the facts I have and sort of decide what emphasis I want to put on the conversation at this moment. But the effect of it is to create, an, an, uh, is to at least create a, a kind of drama in which they can see the professor struggling to figure something out or working on articulating something clearly. And I have come to think that that's the essence of why my lectures matter to the students. Not because the information I give them, they could get from a book. But the, but the way I organize the material, the way I put the material together, and especially the way I model the process of synthesizing the material, is I think what is special about the lecture. I'm not sure, but that's how I have come to feel about it. I'm not sure whether this makes sense to the rest of you, but, uh, or whether it would work in science, because I mean, there is sort of basic information you need to tell. I mean, I don't know whether you, you need to model how you think about the theory of relativity. You just tell them what the theory of relativity is. It's not quite exact. In other words, it seems to me if we're talking about an interpretive enterprise like teaching, like humanities teaching, this may be the, the kind of model I'm talking about may be more compelling. But nonetheless, I, I, it can't be completely true that there's a difference because a, a science lecture is still engaged in the same act of synthesizing and organizing uh, that I've described here. And it would seem to me it would have something of the same consequence, but I'm not certain about it. Do you want to talk I, well, I, you know, I think I'd go back to my point that at the introductory level and at the more advanced level, the strategy of teaching really changes. You know, my introductory lectures are carefully orchestrated. I have written out everything that I'm going to put on each of my 12 blackboards, and I've written the time at which I am going to complete what is on each. And you know, I really try to follow that. Um, and I try to put kind of fun things in my lectures. You know, I teach in 10 minute increments. We have a stretch halfway through. I take myself to the back of the room. We have a little <laughs> quiz. You know, there's stuff, right? We have a good time for our 50 minutes together. Um, but it's really carefully orchestrated. At the graduate level, that's much less true. It's really much more discursive. And I go in and start talking about something, and I'm armed with lots of material and literature and so on. But there really are honest questions that I would like to engage with um, the students on. And then it really is a question. I don't, exa I don't know what they're going to give me the answers for. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I know some of the answers. And some of them, there are times they're a complete surprise, which is really fantastic. And then it's much more, you know, what you alluded to. There's kind of a process by which the material is synthesized as it's delivered. I don't think that works at the introductory level where, you know, there's a lot of students and there's not much time and there's material that one has to get through so that they can go on to their problem set, which is due at the end of the week, you know? Well, one thing we've been talking about without confronting it directly is the, is the digital revolution, is what, what the implicate, and all of, all of the folks here, in, uh, 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 all of uh, the panelists here have digital projects of various kinds. Robert has an edX uh, uh, course in the art of poetry that is about to be uh, published. Uh, uh, um, Second iteration, we did it last year. And the second iteration begins March 24th. So I, I've already done it. And, and you, both of you have digital projects that you might briefly mention that would be helpful for people to know about. Uh, well, my favorite course to teach is a course called The Early Universe, which is what I work on. Uh, and that is now available on OCW with videos and so on. It's not a MOOC, but uh, the lectures and problem sets are all available. I'm, I have a lot of digital projects in the works. The, one of them is called Pre-701, Getting Up to Speed in Biology. It's for the students, the 15% of students who really can't handle introductory biology because MIT introductory biology is kind of at a high level. So I started a new course over IAP, which is 
bringing people up to speed. And that um, I taught and developed the material, and it's going to go on to um, MITx over the summer. And then I have another project called Frontiers of Development, which is a synthesis of all of the wonderful scholars who teach developmental biology here at MIT. And really, it's um, going to be a very modular course where people will be able to pick and choose what they want to know about development, whether they're cancer biologists or um, introductory students or CEOs of companies who want to kind of know what's going on in the field. So that's fun. And then I have a whole project to develop um, recitation problems that are going to be up on um, MITx when they're developed. But Hazel, I'm going, look, to use, I'm going to use this electronic thing to have another thought that came to me. I never thought of it before about lectures. Maybe an advantage of the lecture compared to the textbook is that it's uh, an important aspect of teaching we haven't mentioned, which is that it's exigent. It exacts things from the students. You can't read at your own pace. The lecture has its own rhythm, and you must exercise your ability to absorb, to take notes, to reflect. Good lecturers sometimes say, this is very important, so don't write it, write it down. Don't write this down, because it matters. Mm -hmm. And there's that rhythm of what is uh, merely being absorbed for later reflection, what is to be attended to right away. That demands a lot of the students. I left that out of my description of uh, uh, my Monday talk with these global fellows. I said, I'm not scolding you. And I said to them, meaning it, we let you down. We, the, the creative writing program, did not provide you with an exacting set of requirements for these proposals, mm -hmm. even though they're proposals you will get the money for with you, whatever we think. We should have begun the conversation by saying, you must have a definition, you must have a set of people or books that you're going to do. And, and a strength of the lecture that I miss in the MOOC, I'm proud of the MOOC, but the MOOC doesn't happen. It's in real time for each separate student separately. Mm -hmm. And in that audience or that assembly, that community for the lecture, you, you know, you're, you're, you're doing uh, exercising together. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get somewhere in that 50 minutes or whatever. Hazel, here's one question that occurred to me as you were speaking about your digital projects. It seems as if the, the digital projects you describe would not contain the existential energies you were praising in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true? And that, does that mean that, we think that, that you actually think digital education is therefore limited, that it will really never replace uh, ordinary lectures? Mm. Well, I, you know, I think that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm not a, actually, I really dislike the flipped classroom notion. I think it just really bothers me. Which? The flipped classroom. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. okay. It's a, it's a concept that yeah, I really I dislike. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, I, you know, my digital projects are ones that sort of augment the actual in-person projects and rather than replace them or are something completely different. The developmental biology course I'm putting together, Frontiers of Development, is like nothing that exists at MIT. It's kind of a synthesis of bits of scholarship that I think um, will come together in a really novel way and so that it's different it's just different there is no lecture course that it is supplanting and you know it's a it's therefore in my opinion a worthwhile um, kind of uh, process I you know I think there are places where excellent lectures that are digital are really helpful for students and really um, give students the opportunity to see lecturers of the highest caliber present their material in the highest way. But I don't think MIT is that place. I think at MIT we can present to our students in person the material and that that is part of the privilege of being an MIT student and the experience of being an MIT student. I think digital material is very interesting. There's all sorts of stuff that I've been playing with that I think really can help students learn in ways that are more fun, that are more effective, but I don't see, you know, changing lectures to, to digital. I, 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 not here. Not at MIT. The final topic that I want our t 
panel to discuss before we open it up to the audience. I hope you're all thinking about ways of arguing and concretizing what we've been saying. Is The broad topic is what I call the politics of teaching. And I don't mean ideologically uh, the p politics in that sense. What I mean is the constant argument and, and anxiety that surrounds the question of whether or not teaching is truly an activity that is respected and rewarded, in, in, especially in advanced universities, in elite institutions. The, one of the oddities about our profession is that it's one of the very few professions in which the reward structure is such that as you become more f well known and more successful, you're asked to do your job less. Because, right, because the, the stronger the teacher, it, uh, the, the more elite the institution, the lighter the teaching load. Uh, that seems contradictory in some ways to me. And uh, but more generally, what I'd like us to at least briefly to make some comments on and talk about a bit before we open it up for general discussion is the, is the kind of argument that, some, that, that we often hear from the mouths of parents, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, you, guys, yeah, you guys are very well paid, and you teach such a, a tiny, number of, tiny number of classes. And uh, my student, my, 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 my son or daughter needs a lot of attention, and here you are cramming them into big lecture courses. Uh, if you taught a little bit more, if, you t if, if your workload was closer to the workload of, this, of the civilian population, uh, you, you, would, you would be doing uh, the country a favor. How, how, do, how does one respond to that kind of, to that kind of complaint? I mean, I, I, I want to admit that. I mean, I feel that there's some justice in, in the complaint. There is, a, there is a sense in which, although, and of course it varies from institution to institution, but there's a sense in which uh, very powerful and gifted teachers who are perhaps not productive as scholars are certainly not bound for success in the elite institutions. And that may not be so serious if the people who were promoted were good teachers, but the averse is also sometimes the case, that a person who's not a very good teacher but is a brilliant or apparently very successful uh, researcher will be retained by the, and so one of the things I, I, I want us to at least meditate on a little bit is this recurring complaint, not only that amateurs and civilians make about the academy, but that those of us inside the academy often feel as well. And I'm just wondering if you have, feelings about this, if you think the charge is reasonable or unfair, if you think it's a good thing that the more successful a researcher is, the less that person has to teach, that kind of question. I could comment. I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> we'll start with you and we'll come <laughs> over. <laughs> you. you know, I think in a great research university, there's really a major currency for promotion, which is research prowess. And I think for promotion to tenure, that that is how a great research university stays great, and I think that is why our major currency for promotion to tenure is research prowess. I think, um, however, I think after tenure, one is able to take full advantage of the freedoms that being in the academy afford, and that is really an extraordinary opportunity. I, I'm writing for the faculty newsletter an article called The Job of Professor. Because you know we have such a complex job here as professors, but if you look at the job descriptions in the advertisements for our junior faculty, there is really, it's really, you know, we're searching for someone, you know, in cosmology or in cancer research who has an interest in teaching at the undergraduate and graduate level, and that's it. You know, that is what our job descriptions are. But in fact, as one goes through the ranks, you realize that the job of professor is extremely complex, that there's teaching and mentoring and governance and all sorts of things that whatever you can dream of, um, you have the freedom to do. And so I think there's a balance at the junior level where promotion really has to be about research. I think there are rewards for research throughout one's career, which are appropriate because this is a research university. But I think as people go on in their careers, there really is the freedom to think about where to put effort. And education is one of those places. And of course, education is more than just teaching. There's, there's so much of it there. 
That being said, I think we do not teach our faculty to be professors. We don't teach people at the faculty level how to teach. I'm seeing Daniel there. We've had a discussion about you know, maybe doing something there. I'm looking at Haynes, who has played a major role on OCW in putting together um, you know, programs that are about how we teach. I think we don't do a good job, in fact, we don't do any job at all in teaching faculty how to teach. And we don't you know, teach faculty to do all those other things like manage businesses and you know, manage people and all the other things that you have to do. So I, I think that, but, but I think that the currency of promotion that we have right now is okay. And what we really you know, need to make sure is that as faculty move up through the ranks, the freedom to go and focus on education or on other aspects of um, the professorship is supported and is respected. Comment, Ellen? Uh, yeah, I guess I'd like to say that um, speaking for the Department of Physics, which is where I'm at and don't know that much about the details of what happens in other departments, uh, but in the physics department for at least the last 10, maybe 20 years, uh, teaching really has played a significant role in tenure decisions, for example, or promotions in general. Uh, it's true that you cannot get a tenured position in the physics department through teaching alone. Uh, you need a solid research record. Um, and I think it's also true that with a really fantastic research record, you'd probably get tenure even if you were a lousy teacher. Uh, but nonetheless, the common case is a research case which is incredibly strong, but which still could go either way because judging research is a very subjective thing. Uh, and in those cases, teaching has played, I think, a pretty significant role uh, in the decisions of who has gotten tenure in physics and, and who has not. And I think most of our young faculty really are incredibly good teachers. Uh, so I think there's at least a, a shift of emphasis in that direction, uh, at least within the physics department, which I think, I think is very healthy. Um, I should also add that I think the basic em emphasis on research uh, is real. I don't think it should be replaced by an emphasis on teaching. I think what makes MIT a great educational institution is that we have such experts in all fields. And that's really what the students are coming here for in, in the first place. Uh, so I think we're right to emphasize research, but to also give significant credence to teaching. And, uh, and I think maybe that is actually what's being done. Robert. I feel like this is an extremely large and important, this socio-political nature of teaching. I wish I knew more about the subject, but it's a very, very powerful subject. Apparently, and I wish I did have the statistics, but it may be more than half of the educational courses, the student per course, are taught in community colleges in this country. Increasingly, adjuncts and graduate students mm -hmm. teach courses. The admission system at most elite places, maybe at MIT less than others, is profoundly corrupt in its history. It began in the 20th century with its roots mainly in anti-Semitism. <laughs> this whole thing of the well-rounded person and geographical distribution, it was all designed to keep Jews out of Princeton and Yale and Harvard. There's this book called The Chosen that documents that. If we want to have a country in which can, we continue to have the vitality of previous generations in relation to education. Teaching in community colleges and in the whole spectrum, we have to start paying attention to it in a way that we're failing to tremendously. And uh, we are living in a kind of, a bit, with our institutional life, we're living a little bit in a kind of la-la land. We are not in contact with the most important issues to do with our profession and the future of our profession, where the bright people will come from. If we leave it simply to social factors and to the socionomic activity of the admissions office, all due respect to the admissions office, mm -hmm. we decay as a society. So the socio-political questions about teaching are larger and much more important than I can deal with. I'm embarrassed that I don't know more about them, but I am aware of them. And as a transition to the uh, MOOC, as I said, I'm proud of my MOOC. I've been struck by how much educational governance people 
provosts and presidents and deans are extremely interested in my MOOC, <laughs> more than in most other things I do. <laughs> and I'm afraid it may have to do with what you alluded to, with this idea that somehow we have a wonderful new technological alternative mm. to the way we've been doing this. And especially, we can give it to the masses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It will solve social problems and inequities. Mm -hmm. I, that's disturbing to me. Not just that. It can save us a lot of money. We can fire all our money, professors we can, and, we have, can, and have a Pinsky DVD. We can have, we can have a Pinsky DVD that will be the, <laughs> and, the poetry <laughs> education for all the community colleges. I, I f the most. I'll talk about two, um, I'll talk about a couple of defects I found with the MOOC. And it was very successful. The only BU edX MOOC that had more uh, resisted attrition better and had higher enrollment was the baseball saber metrics. <laughs> so unexpectedly, poetry, and as again, I'm made uneasy by the congratulations I get for this. <laughs> and, um, it's based on videos that MIT helped me make. I recommend them to everyone. Favoritepoem.org. Favoritepoem.org. You will see a construction worker reading Whitman, talking very cogently about Whitman. You'll see a wonderful um, photography student talk about a Sylvia Plath. He's a Jamaican guy. And the Sylvia Plath poem speaks to him. You'll see a Cambodian-American high school student in San Jose read a Langston Hughes poem. And those are very short. They have the virtue of being three to five minutes. And they are one element in the course. I added five to 12-minute mini lectures. And then we had discussion groups. And the discussion groups included a poetry teacher, the guy who does the garden at my uh, condo, uh, a high school student, uh, again, a range of professions and ages, about 10 minutes each. And when we finished the MOOC, the edX people and the BU people were very interested on the next iteration of the MOOC. I found myself much less so. I'm glad to do it. But my great concern, I described it to them as the trough. I wanted this to be a bit like a book or a library. Can we not make? a website where there's just a list of these things. Just describe the 10 minute lectures and describe the, they're edited down to 10 or 15 uh, discussions. And just have them where the person with intellectual curiosity, as though in a public library, can just go through the trough. None of the structure of a course. It's not a course. It's a set of resources. It's a digital, it's a, it's a book in the cloud, whatever you want to call it. And I, was, I, I felt that these materials we had assembled, arranging them in a course was all too soothing or all too attractive if you want to substitute this for courses. And I was more interested in them as materials than as courses. So I'm happy to do it as a course again. It sounds as if you made an anthology rather than a systematic course. It's a, it's well, we made a systematic course. And in some ways, the thing that interested me most was the anthology of discussions, lectures, prose, all of that together. Incidentally, about the technological sub science subjects and uh, discussion subjects, the edX platform, we had discussion pods. This may have to do, they say it's going to be better. They hadn't done that many humanities courses. Our discussions collapsed the edX software. Mm. <laughs> it crashed. Mm -hmm. It couldn't deal with all the many, many people who had a lot of yakking they wanted to do about poems. Mm -hmm. They had not run into this. And I had my graduate student slaves were having dialogue with these people. And edX <laughs> couldn't handle it. I, I, I just, I'm really interested to hear. I'm chair of the MITx Faculty Advisory Committee. <laughs> I'm there as kind of Joe faculty member who knows, who does not program, you know, but can represent, and with a wonderful committee, you know, represent the interests of the faculty. And actually, we were just talking today about the limitations of the MITx edX platform and reaching out to get feedback on those limitations and then trying to address them. So, you know, 
your experience is an awesome one to document. Somebody told me, we had a meeting with the edX people, and I was merciless. Ah, oh, good, and great. They yeah. were so nice about it. And somebody explained to me afterwards, programmers love complaints. <laughs> <laughs> They're delighted to hear the thing was a mess. It's like a game for them. Right. Well, I, uh, I, let me ask the audience to sort of concentrate your minds for, for uh, comments and questions. But I, ha I want to, I, I have a sort of transition anecdote. Uh, nothing, nothing fancy or, 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 or profound, but moving, I think. Uh, when I was thinking about our session and talking about the significance or value of college teaching, uh, uh, I, I, I happened up, up upon a little squib in the Times Literary Supplement of December 4th. And it, told us, it, 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 it talked about the great uh, uh, literary theorist, Mikhail Bakhtin, about whom, uh, uh, who was a, a very uh, honored figure, uh, as you, most of you know, internationally for his, for his uh, theoretical and, and, and uh, historical work. But in the city of Saransk, Russia, where he lived as, as a, the TLS said, in obscurity between 1946 and 1969, I'm quoting here, a former political exile and chain-smoking amputee, Bakhtin is remembered most of all as a teacher, gesticulating, uh, quote, gesticulating passionately, Mikhail Mikhailovich would sometimes knock his crutches to the floor, but neither he nor his audience would notice. Mikhail Glebochin reminisced in Roskaya Gazeta last week. Sometimes we would carry him upstairs in our arms. He would lecture without notes, quoting not just poems, but vast chunks of prose, word for word. Um, the statue that they uh, installed marks the 120th anniversary of uh, Bakhtin's death. And this image of Bakhtin, surrounded by his beloved students, waving his arms, being carried up the stairs, oblivious to his own debility, seems to me and resonates with me in ways I can't even fully articulate. And something important about teaching is told in that anecdote. Well, questions, comments, additions, attacks from the audience, please, let's, let, let, let's hear it from our from our fellow colleagues, from our colleagues, from our fellow, from our fellow teachers. Arthur. If I can just make a little intermission because I feel the discussion will be mostly about lecturing since there are four lecturers in front of us. Well, we do other things too, but, uh, <laughs> but I was most struck by uh, Robert Pinsky's comments, introductory comments about his a teacher, a mechanical engineer, a mechanical drawing teacher. Uh, obviously, that was straight out of Plato. Uh, it was a Platonic dialogue, and uh, I guess my question is, uh, have the four of you ever dreamt of doing something similar yourself? And because it's the absolute antithesis of the lecture, I, I, I view it that way. Uh, there's no, it's, it's totally different, uh, but it's a totally different experience for both the teacher and the student, as the evidence indicates. Uh, it's what you came up with. Uh, for example, have you ever repeated it yourself, tried to do something similar with a, a small group of students? Very often. I don't have a super, I, I, I hope I have an intuitively organized mind, but I've always been a terrible note taker. I don't know how to make outlines. Uh, I couldn't possibly plan a lecture and after so many minutes this happens. I need to improvise. I'm made nervous by preparation. And if I didn't feel I could occasionally go into the mode of encouraging students to ask me considered questions. I couldn't do this profession. I couldn't function in it. So the McWithy example is to some extent autobiographical. I don't want to vaunt that I am as effective as he was on that occasion, but I rely on it. If all I could, I approve of the model of, I think it's much maligned, the model of just pouring information into students. A lot to be said for it. It's really what we're doing, is we're going to die. 
We're going to try to pour it into them so they can pour it to somebody else before they die. I don't, I'm not sentimental, you know, I'm not saying we mustn't do that. I personally can only function by having them draw something out of me. As on this occasion, I couldn't have prepared anything I've said. I rely on David, Alan, and Hazel will say something. You just said something. Then I've, I get energized. But I, I, I think for some of us, by which I mean me, that's the only way. <laughs> uh, sir. Hi, I'm Charles Leiserson, uh, also McVicker Fellow, which there seem to be one or two of us around here, from uh, computer science. And uh, a little disappointed not to have some engineering representation on the uh, panel, but that's, yes. that's OK. I'll have my say. Um, Good. <laughs> uh, you know, when I looked at the um, announcement for uh, this, uh, the first line was, what separates a good teacher from a great one? And I think a lot of you, from my point of view, you've danced around that question rather than actually addressing it. Uh, we heard a lot about wonderful techniques, but we didn't get to understand, uh, you know, for Hazel or for uh, Robert or any of these other things, why these people were using these techniques. And I think that the answer is, uh, is love. And the answer is, the reason you're doing this is because you love your audience, your students. Otherwise, why are you doing this, OK? What is it? And I think, Robert, the comment you just made about giving something of yourself to them, that's all about love. And what I have found is the most important thing in teaching is that you actually love your students, because then it dictates all the things you need to do in terms of technique, OK? Because then you prepare for your students, because you love them, OK? The difference of the different formats, digital or whatever, a lot of that is it is easier to love somebody when they are in your arms, OK? <laughs> it is easier to love them when they are in the room reacting to you. I've written a, a very popular textbook in computer science. And that was a lot harder than lecturing, OK? Why? Well, because the person that I'm trying to love isn't there. I have to sort of imagine the person who's there rather than having them there. And I think until we understand that, uh, that teaching and learning is all based on emotion, and in particular on this loving relationship. You know, we're going to do this, you know, you know, what does MCAS or No Child Left Behind have to do with love? Nothing. That's why those aren't successful programs. And until we understand that kind of thing, whether it's K through 12 or graduate, the reason that I think that research is so important is because you love your research and if you don't have somebody, you know, you get tenure because you demonstrate you really love that stuff and because we're human we really want to share our love of things with people we love. Okay, and, and so I think until people understand whether it be at an engineering school or at uh, uh, you know, humanities or whatever, that that's the foundation of good teaching. I don't think we make much progress in this country towards the enormous uh, educational problems that we have to solve. I have one thing to add. I agree with everything you said, but I would add that it's love also toward and having received from your predecessors. The deceased that you remember personally but also, you know, I'm the servant of Emily Dickinson and of the past. And one feels a quasi-filial loyalty to the dead, to the past. And for me, it has a lot to do with mortality. Then you have a quasi-parental relationship with the ones younger than you. I, I think I would resist love as the explanation, even though I think, I'm, I, think I understand your point. But I, I, I would be much more comfortable reformulating, and partly because I, I've been doing this for 50 years, it'd be very promiscuous of me to have had so many love affairs. But I, I, more seriously, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. But I, I guess in my own case, 
what I think of is, I, I think I have, and I, I know other teachers, I think Alan has this, just from having had conversations with him. Uh, and I know Robert has this impulse, although it's, he's become more imperial as he's become, uh, uh, as, he's, as he's become more, fam more famous. But, but uh, uh, I think that, that I have an explainer gene in me. In other words, I, when I know something, I want everybody else to know it. It's not, in fact, not everybody has this impulse. Uh, and I think that one way to think about what a teacher is, as, as to distinguish a teacher from other kinds of authority figures, is to say that one of the really wonderful things about it, maybe this is a variation on your love principle, is that the authority of the teacher is an authority the teacher wants to give away, whereas most authority figures want to hold on to their authority. They don't want to share it. But what the, the secret of what a teacher does is he wants to, ideally, the, secret, the teacher wants the intellectual authority that she has to be the property of the student, this wants to give it away, wants the student to have it. And uh, that may be a more elaborate way of saying that some, I often feel that I'm burdened with an understanding that doesn't really become satisfying to me until other people have it themselves. Now, and I know this is not universal in people, but I think it's a very common impulse in, real, in teachers. I think teachers have some desire to let other people know what they've learned. It's their excitement about the value of what they know is democratic. Uh, now, I don't know that's exactly what you were saying, but I think there's a connection. I could comment. You know, I think this question of what's a good teacher and a great teacher is easily stated, but I think the answer is really complex because I think there are different kinds of good teachers and there are different kinds of great teachers. And, you know, um, I, I would be hard pressed to say these attributes make a great teacher. You know, you've defined how it works for you. And, you know, that resonates with me some. But I really look around at my colleagues and I think there are different ways of presenting to a group that really, you know, make me say, wow, <laughs> it's really good. It'll make me say, okay, fine. You know, for me, it's, it's the connection. If I feel like I'm actually speaking to my 300 students as individuals, then I feel like, you know, I've done it. And for me, the greatest um, compliment in the course evaluations is if a student says, you know, Professor Siv made me feel like I was the only person in 26100, then I know I've kind of got there. You know, we've made a connection even amidst this really large group of students. But I do think it's a complex question and it's got a complex answer. Hi, I'm, I'm, um, I'm Arthur Barr uh, in the literature faculty. Um, and to the, to the point, to the question of good versus great teachers, um, one way that, I, that, that occurred to me to think about that when I saw the poster for this event was to think about um, teaching as job versus teaching as vocation, um, as something one feels called to do uh, rather than simply the job that one has, which one may like very much, but is a job that one wouldn't do if it weren't one's job. Um, and I, I know, speaking for myself personally, that um, being a scholar and being the researcher that, um, that Hazel, uh, inhabiting the role that Hazel identified as the, correctly, as the, the, the prime mover of promotion decisions at this institute, being a scholar is my job. I'm good enough at it to have gotten tenure, but it's not my vocation. It's not why I wanted to become a professor. Um, and be, being a teacher is why I wanted to become a professor. When you first articulated this, I thought it was brave of you, and I feel it now, too. I, I, I think well, I'm the same, but, <laughs> but it's, it's tough to confess. Well, it, it, you know, there, it is the kind of, it is perversely the kind of thing one can say only after having received tenure, in fact. I, I mean that, I, I mean, oh, I mean yes. that quite literally. Um, and I think, but I think more of us need, who feel that way, and this is not to say, and in, in my, my point is not that sort of teachers are noble in precise and inverse proportion to s the, the extent to which scholars are smart, right? It's, um, this is about getting rid of that kind of value judgment. But I think that will only happen if more of us who do feel that way um, come out of the closet. <laughs> yes, use the mic. Hi, I'm Mark Hessler, I'm an alum from Once Upon a Time and I've been experienced quite a bit of the teaching from people I've heard from here, so that's neat. I was a high school English teacher and science teacher 
So I'm tempted to comment on that difference. But I also just want to say about love. Uh, I went to ed school once upon a time, and one of the things that I learned there about teaching was that unlike other close relationships, it's designed for termination. The goal of the relationship is that it ends and that it ends well. And so I think part of doing it well and the teachers who are very good at it bear very firmly in mind that, that last day and what they want their students to walk away with. So I think the, the passing of the torch is very important. Computer science is much newer, so you're not worried about people 300 years ago and, and their legacy. But indeed, in literature, that might be an important part of your personal sense of mission, passing a torch on. Because in the end, it's the job of the young to kick the old off the planet, as I said. And so we have this chance as teachers to pass something on. Now, it's very, I think it is very different with the new and exciting fields of our digital, the madness we're living through, and the new, you know, the new opportunities that exist. Computer science is right in the middle of that. So it is a little bit different. But ultimately, the, I think the, the issue with love is that it's a very tough kind of love that bears in mind that the last day is coming every day. Science and there's a very long history of passing down of mathematics and so forth. I wouldn't say, and even you know, uh, Alan Turing, people are relatively recent. It goes back to uh, Church, to Gödel, to you know, and you know, Russell and and uh, Whitehead, I mean, and then take it back into the Greeks and so forth. I mean, I, I think I have the same tradition you do, and I do think. Passing the, the torch is a is a big piece of that, you know. It's uh, it, when you put it that way. Computer science is built on math. I had a little bit of experience teaching math, and something that I didn't expect to feel, which I felt doing it, was how incredibly venerable it was. Students famously don't like math at the high school level, but I had this feeling that I was passing on something ancient, and that the curriculum couldn't really be argued with. You know, any literature teacher might choose to teach a book, and the kids can argue, oh, why do we have to read that? And the teacher has to be very clever and creative to convince the kids that it's a good idea to read it. But with math, there's really very little argument they can make. You know, it's, but this, is, this is how it's been done for 2,500 years, the Pythagorean theorem, and, and they, they're forced to respect it. So there's an authority behind math teaching and I suppose computer science that doesn't exist for humanities. Humanity t teachers have to create their own authority. And I think, David, that's where the passion comes in. I, I, okay, I'm talking more than I meant to, but I'll say one more thing. The, the, um, about the science versus humanities, one difference at the high school level is that kids have a great deal of experience being people and living, so they're kind of prepared to be like grad students um, in, in terms of the, the teacher can interact with them as very mature people and can trust that the students have a lot of experience with life and with re if it's an English class, that they've read a lot already, even if they don't read much. But in particular, they have a lot of experience being human. So in humanities, they're already kind of experts by the time you have them in high school or as undergraduates. Whereas in biology, I imagine, if it's, you know, you're talking about pre-701, a student who hasn't, a student at 17 or 18 or 20 is not yet really steeped in biology and is not an expert. So I think that's why the teaching a freshman English class could be like teaching a graduate seminar in, that, in terms of that difference, that you're dealing with experts at being human, whereas you're not dealing with experts <laughs> in biology at that age. So I think that's a really big difference, and all the strategies change, and maybe they become more like the graduate strategies. Um, I had other things to say, but I'll stop. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes. This is Stephen Tapsco, who's speaking here. Speak loudly. I teach at an institute where my students are, for the most part, smarter than I am. And um, they're just more flexible in their ability to use what they know. Um, I think I know more, and over time, one develops competence and guile. Um, but. You guys have me thinking. Hazel's emphasis on permission to think outside the box and, and Robert's work on MOOCs and David's brave acknowledgement about his suspicion of his own charm as a lecturer. <clears throat> you guys have me thinking about a moment in Dante 
I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, Alan. The, um, <laughs> about halfway through the, down the inferno, and it's deep down, um, Dante puts his teacher, Brunetto Latini, um, he locates him as a, uh, maybe a sodomite, maybe an invert, um, maybe introverted, right? But they, they dance in a circle facing each other, and, and the they rain of fire falls on them. And I've always wondered, why does Dante do that? Uh, there's the no teacher. contemporary evidence that Latini was. So my, my question is, um, yeah, he's his beloved teacher and mentor, um, and he greets him affectionately. So my question is either to the humanists, why, why does Dante do that? If it's true, that's a weird thing to do. If it's not true, it's an even weirder thing to do, right? Um, it's either why does Dante do that, or is there something in there about the teacher-student relationship and the need for the, the to leave the student room to surpass the teacher or get past the teacher or something? Which maybe we should ask the Dante translator. To <laughs> he even says. <laughs> he even says, if it were up to me, Brunetto, you would not be suffering like this, which is. Um, like a very layered, unpleasant joke, because maybe we should. He's maybe, writing maybe, this. Book. Hold on a second, Robert. Maybe the so, so, look. Not everyone in the audience is up on Dante. Maybe we should be more explicit about this moment. It is a very dramatic moment in the Inferno. Da, Stephen said it right, but let's repeat it, Stephen. What, the, Dante is meeting his favorite teacher, his mentor, and his mentor is deep in the. It's being punished. He's deep, deep in hell. He's in the lower circles of hell. And Stephen's saying, why is he there? I thought the answer was fairly obvious, that he had violated God's rule, uh, what Dante believed to, to be God's uh, law by being homosexual. But, but, uh, and, and so that even though Dante feels great affection for him and benefited from this man, God's laws are inflexible, and that's why he has to be here. But the more, so, so that, but that's, but, but it's been a crux. For those of you who don't know the passage, it's been a crux for years, especially for teachers, exactly because of the drama that Stephen is talking about. Now tell us what it means, Robert. I think Stephen was talking to something that I thought when Mark was speaking. Um, I recently read, my wife is on the last chapter, last phases of a book she's writing <clears throat> about psychoanalysis. And a large part of the book is about, they use the term termination, as they do use the term love. And that also, that therapeutic relationship, is also one, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very close relationship whose purpose is to end. They have that rather peculiar Latin term for it. And I think what Stephen is implying, and he, he wasn't his teacher in any sense that's very similar to what we do at uh, Yale or Amherst or at MIT. It wasn't a classroom. Or he, it was much more personal instruction. But Dr. Ellen Pinsky, uh, in this very tech, you know, professional book, she does use the term love. Uh, and she does use also the term vengeance, that the neutrality of the, um, the, the book is called Mortal Gifts, has to do with mortality, and the fact that the therapist can die, eventually will die, and is mortal in the sense of imperfection. It's a function, perhaps like teaching, as she says, could not be performed by a robot or an angel, or Jonathan Swift Winham. It can o the, that therapeutic function can only be performed by someone who is mortal. And I think what Stephen is implying in the Dante passage is that in a quasi-parental or quasi-filial relationship, there would be an element of rage and vengeance. Wow. Further comment? Yes. <laughs> Oh, do you have a comment? Is there a way to use that? <laughs> to use what? To use that energy. <clears throat> she proposes the gifts one does in therapy, I think one does in life. 
Now, as Mr. Rogers used to say, it's the very same people that make you angry and that make you glad. And of course, in teaching, I, I, I agree with uh, the, uh, that in a way you love students. And after the class is over, you realize a per particular student is really an annoying person, <laughs> somebody you didn't much like. But while the class is happening, you, you, know, you, you're, you are in that role. You're trying to give them what you got to, to hand it on. And um, I would imagine there's psychic energy comes from con that controlling or channeling that, uh, as with being a dad or a child. You know, if you're a parent or a child, you have to know how to deal with the fact that you, uh, if you weren't so cute, I would probably eat you. <laughs> yes, sir. So I'm, I'm Daniel Jackson from Computer Science. This has been uh, an incredibly inspiring and thought-provoking discussion. Um, and we've talked mostly about the role of teachers. Uh, and I wonder if we could talk for a minute about the role of students. Uh, and in particular, think about learning. It seems to me that one of the most important things about teaching is teaching our students how to learn. And indeed, I think that's one of the values of a lecture, that it's simply a good skill to learn, to be able to sit and listen to somebody talk. And if we eliminate lectures from our curriculum, uh, then our students will never acquire that skill. Um, I think a lot about my own teaching failures. Um, and uh, I also think about my students' learning failures and to what extent I'm responsible for those. Um, but there is one moment of student failure that I'm most upset about, and I think I am undoubtedly partially to blame for it, but I also believe that our culture is to blame for it, and I'd like to tell you what it is. Um, I very avidly note the number of students who turn up to my lectures as a, as a sort of ongoing measure of whether I'm doing a good job or not. And um, my students are normally in the main class I teach in their third or fourth year, and they're pretty jaded already, and they're very overworked. And so it, I have to admit, it's a fight to get them to come to lecture, and I sort of relish that fight. Um, but there is always one thing that I regard as a terrible failure, which is there is one lecture that I cannot get them to come to. And that is the lecture in which their colleagues, their peers, present their work and receive awards for it. And I find this deeply upsetting, and I, I do all kinds of games to try and make this lecture more exciting, but I know why they don't come. They don't come because there'll be nothing they'll be tested on, there'll be nothing they'll be graded on. Um, it's a lecture, it's actually the last lecture of the class, and I don't have a nor the, our normal little quiz games and stuff, um, which create tiny little, tiny little uh, incentives for them to come. And I wonder, you know, I, th I think, I, as a computer scientist, I should think about programming, but I really think more about deprogramming. Uh, and I wonder if we need to deprogram our students that they've developed such an instrumental notion of education and what it's about um, that they don't, uh, or they won't say they don't have the sense of community that Hazel talked about, but we have to fight against the culture we're in in order to, in order to establish that notion of community. And I personally feel that it's a big struggle. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I'm alone in this, but and if it's entirely due to my own fault as a teacher, but I wonder if there's something we need to do as an institution to instill in our students the value of being, being part of this community and playing their role as, as learners. I think that's a, a profoundly important point about, the, about how instrumental the students sometimes are. The atmosphere encourages it. They're, they have, they're so overscheduled and so busy that they're often doing triage on their courses. I, one form that that takes in the humanities for, uh, is that exams are not always necessarily the most appropriate way to measure what students do in the humanities. But the problem is, if you don't give them regular work, some equivalent to exams and problem sets, they don't treat their courses in our part of the institute with the same seriousness and rigor that they do the other side. And there are all kinds of tricks you can play, but I mean, I, but, and I feel guilty when I have to do it, create a weekly assignment that keeps them working, a kind of equivalent of that, other tricks like that. In small classes, what I hope to do sometimes, and it's a I try to use your trick of measuring their, their, their interest and as a, to judge whether I've been successful, is I actually try to teach them without exams to get a set, but although I make them perform in class and write short assignments, uh, and I try to estimate how uh, engaged they are week by week. And it's a when, I'm, when I'm successful, I can see they're doing the work and keeping up. But when I'm not successful, 
It's almost always because I have not scheduled regular exams that would make them do it. Now, I don't know what the solution is, but it's an, it's an issue that I've never resolved fully. Yes? I, I was just going to reply to that. I teach in the writing program. Could you use the microphone, even though it's only a couple, because we're recording this, so it won't be heard otherwise? Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen. I teach in the writing program. And I've, I have some experience using peer review. Um, so I, I teach courses in the biology department, but as the writing instructor. And I'm very interested in developing that, and I'd be happy to share some ideas with you. Because peer review, um, although it hasn't been my intention to, to sort of institute it for that purpose particularly, but I think the effect can be, the, can be helpful for, for the problem that you mentioned, which I guess we're, we're all aware of. You reminded me of the most discouraging, depressing, and doleful thing I've ever known about teaching. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I taught at Wellesley College, where they had a very elaborate student evaluation system. And somebody, you all could probably put this better than I did, somebody took that data and excluded the good from the bad to the wonderful. To the, they tried to make the data reflect which category, of course, which category, of course, won the highest ratings from the Wellesley students? By category, you mean what? What was it? What, what, department, what department and what kind of course? Oh, I see. OK. What? Why is this so depressing to you? <laughs> Wait, Booby. Oh, OK. <laughs> First year of a language, because the lectures are closely related to the textbook and the examinations. Your grade is very precisely proportionate to the amount of time and energy you put into it. It's the, the contract for the grade is very clear. And after you've mastered the material, it is not required to think about it at all. <laughs> That last is very depressing, that's for sure. <laughs> the whole thing is, right. it's that that is where the contract is cleared. Mm -hmm. So all the energy you put into being loving is it. The customers or employees, however you want to think of them, and what you mean by instrumental is, that's on the model of the larger society, grades are their pay. In a place like Wellesley, they're all in tremendous grade inflation, and they're all you know, already past a lot of hurdles, but it's still the mentality. They've been trained that way. So they, their pay level, the, the salary is very precisely related to the work you put into. And you don't have to do all this clumsy, awkward thing of thinking and understanding. <laughs> and uh, that is patently, I think, the explanation of why the most popular kind of course is the first year of a language. And I try to keep that uh, in the back of my mind, not the front. I, I, I can, you know, I, that's, that's a good story. <laughs> you know, I think it's really interesting. I think the question of coming to lecture is kind of part of the college experience question. You know, this is one of your freedoms, right? You come to college. I have a lot of thoughts about the college experience, and, and a lot of them I, I really dislike aspects of, of how our students view college. But you know, there's this tremendous freedom to decide what you're going to do. And lecture is one of the places there's usually no obvious penalty for not going to. And so that's especially true in the large lecture courses. Now you can use clicker technology to make sure you're there. And you can get 5% you know, of your grade if you actually click in. I don't use clickers. In my graduate class, you know, actually 25% of their grade is for showing up. And, you know, if it's a small class, if they're not there, it's very glaring. And I, you know, email them right after and ask where they were. In a large class, it's not true. And I think it's kind of embedded in this notion of freedom. You know, I'll get through introductory biology even if I'm not there, you know. And it probably is going to be true because our students are super smart. And it's probably true in many places. So I think that there's actually you know, a sociological underpinnings, really, to addressing why students go to lecture and don't go to lecture. And it doesn't have everything to do with the quality of the lecture at all. I will say, a year ago, we had a terrible semester of losing a couple of students. And you know, I have never had greater attendance in my class 
that semester because there really was a sense of the usefulness of the community and the support of the community. Um, and that was really quite striking to me that the you know, room was full and we were you know, so sad together, but in a kind of regular semester, which of course you know, is, is far preferable. Yeah, it's, you know, there's students who just don't come and you say you know, it would be much easier if you did come to lecture, but there they are. They've got other stuff to do and it's exercising the freedom of not coming. So I think it's quite interesting. I might just yes. say that I've also been disappointed in some of my classes. This past term, I was teaching a, a freshman class, 801L, uh, and I did kind of discover, it took me a while to discover it. I wasn't as alert as I should have been. But I kind of did discover by the end of the term that if I talked about anything that was not going to be on the exam, uh, they really tuned out. They really didn't want to waste any time on, on that. And I, I do find that very disappointing. Uh, among more upper class students, though, I think things are much better. In, in my upper class classes, uh, I don't think I've seen that very much. And I've also spent a fair amount of time, probably everybody else has too, uh, supervising research projects through the EUROP program of our <laughs> students. Uh, right now, I have three or four EUROP students, or at least students who are sort of doing something in parallel with EUROP if it's not officially through, the, through EUROP. And they're great. They, they, they really do very rapidly become totally dedicated to the project, and it's just delightful to work with students in that context. Yes. Hi, so uh, I'm Nicholas. I'm actually a student here. Um, I like coming to these things because I get to ask older people kind of what's happened, and, and, and um, the question I have is uh, how, how, you, how you've seen student expectations change over over kind of the past 20, 30 years, um, especially people who teach uh, engineering subjects or computer science subjects. Um, because I really feel uh, uh, kind of sitting in the dorms and talking with people that um, students at, at MIT, and especially in, in particular, come to college to, to, to more be trained, to learn kind of uh, workplace skills, to be able to code in Java, to be able to solve an engineering problem or to build rockets to go to space. And um, and so I'm wondering if you if if you felt any any shift in 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 teaching students uh, whose per, whose perspectives have changed over the decades. I think you good. <laughs> you have to start. I mean, I, my, I, I, well, I'll start. <laughs> Let Alan think, I'll let Alan think about his answer, which will be much more weighty than mine. I don't think that, I don't think in the humanities that I've seen a tremendous change because people don't come to MIT with their primary choice to be studying literature or history or, or uh, uh, anthropology. Uh, I, there has been in my 40 years at MIT and 50 years as a, as a full-time professor a decline in students' writing skills. Um, uh, they come into the institution less well, uh, le less effective writers than they were half a century ago when I began. Uh, and even in the, uh, uh, I would say in the last 20 years at MIT, I think I've noticed that the, the, the students are less effective prose writers than they were before. I, I think we at MIT have, have not done a good job in emphasizing the importance of communication skills. And in some ways, we've been evasive about it because we've been reluctant to do what seems to me sort of obvious, which is to have some kind of equivalent of a freshman English course that has to be got through, or, uh, or you, you, you could pass out of it if you passed an exam, but otherwise we'd have to take it. And I, that, I think, might solve some of our problems. But, but uh, apart from that, I've seen no real change in the students, except perhaps that they have, uh, <laughs> they seem to have less time, and they seem from my angle at least, much more motivated to sort of uh, get to graduate school and, 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 and there's, they become more utilitarian maybe than they had been. But that's a marginal change. Uh, my, own, my broadest experience is it's been unbelievably exhilarating, life enhancing beyond anything I could have imagined to be around these, these brilliant children for such a long time. I mean, I, 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 I have tremendous admiration for these students. 
Okay, I, I guess I'd like to start out by saying that although I've been here for 35 years on the faculty, I guess, if I do the subtraction, um, I have a lot of trouble discerning trends. I think old trends happen too adiabatically for me to really follow them. That's my shortcoming, I presume. I just have a short memory, so. Uh, but I guess if I tried to discern any trends, um, I, I think over the years that I've been here, the student body has become more diverse in, in many ways. Uh, more diverse ethnically, racially, in background, and more diverse in their interests, which is probably the main thing that affects teaching. Um, back when I first came here, a fantastic fraction of the incoming students wanted to be physicists, which I thought was great. And now it's a vastly smaller fraction. And now there are more people interested in biology and computer science. And uh, there really seem to be a lot of students interested in solving the problems of the world in various ways, which I tremendously admire. Um, so when I talk to the students, especially in a large course like 801L where they have all different backgrounds, uh, I'm very impressed by the wide range of interests. Uh, at the same time, I think it does mean that they have a somewhat less preparation for technical subjects like 801L um, and that that does show up as well. Uh, all in all, I think it's a good thing. I think uh, we really do have a fantastic group of students. and. Uh, Besides the freshmen that I deal with, I mentioned I deal with a number of, of Europe students who really are interested in going into physics, and they are absolutely fantastic. I've, I've met some of the most fantastic people uh, in, in that context. Uh, so I love our students. I think they're great, and I feel very privileged to be teaching here. I, I think you know our, our students are also. They're great. I think they worry. You know, there's so much worry about where they're going to get jobs, and their parents are worried about where they're going to get jobs. And they're so worried that if they're going to get a B in 701, and that's the end of their lives, you know. And it's, um, I think we so seldom point out to our students that we have a 97% graduation rate here, and actually they're all going to get their degrees, and that, you know, actually there's probably a 0% unemployment rate from anyone with an MIT. IT degree, you know, it's, they're these really positives that I feel like um, are really crucial to communicate to our students and their parents. And I can't remember, you know, if it was like that when I came here. I think I was so worried about getting tenure. Actually, I wasn't really worried about getting tenure, but I was so worried about, you know, trying to set up a research group and do something meaningful. I didn't pay attention. So I have no idea if that's changed over the years at all. But I do think, you know, there's this kind of undercurrent of worrying about I think employment. It's, I, my own feeling is that, it, has, that is, it has increased. That, I think that there's an anxiety level that's, that's greater right. than it was. That's right. And, and I think, you know, it is really up to the faculty to kind of diffuse that because, in fact, it is not a, a valid worry for MIT students. You know, our students really go on and they all do well and they all do something useful and they all earn a living and they all, you know, pretty much do just fine. Mm -hmm. So I think you know this kind of worry is something that we could do better at diffusing when we spoke when we speak to our students. You know, one one quick anecdote about that about about 10 years into my time at MIT, I, I chatted with some of the students in the lecture course I teach the film experience and uh, found that they were full of anxiety that I hadn't uh, understood or hadn't realized was there. And I, so I, uh, uh, toward the end, about two thirds of the way through the term, I gave a brief uh, mini lecture at the start of the, before I actually went into the substance of the course. And essentially the, or the, the lecture was, you know, there's life after failure. If you get an F in a course, you survive. If you take a term off and come back, you survive. Uh, if, you, if you postpone graduation by a year, you survive. And I was, un, I was amazed by the outpouring of gratitude I got from the students. And I've now institutionalized that lecture. And every year, about two thirds of the way through the term, I say, this in my lecture. It's the largest course I teach. So between 50 and 80 students in a good term. Uh, and I think it's a helpful message for the students to get. But every year, one or another student comes up to me and says, it would be much better if a professor of physics were saying this. <laughs> so I'm passing the torch to Alan. <laughs> Okay, I'll take up the challenge. Uh, give me a text, I'll make it easier. <laughs> 
I want to thank the audience and thank our panel. We're finished.